Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everybody, and to welcome to today's webinar. My name is Cheryl Jennison DeProza, and I'm speaking to you from corporate headquarters of Shore here in Niles, Illinois. And I'm joined today, as always, by Gino Sigismondi, who is a system support analyst here at uh, Shore Incorporated. Um, today, we are also joined by product specialist Thomas Banks, and we're going to be discussing um, some techniques on how to get better audio for video and the various Shure products that you can use to capture audio um, when you're making various video productions. Um, but before we get into the bulk of today's presentation, just a few items of housekeeping. First of all, this webinar, as they always are, is going to be recorded and archived, and it can be found at shure.com slash training. Um, there's a little webinars archives link there, and this webinar is all as well as all of our past webinars are there. So if you ever want to come back and refresh yourself on this or direct a colleague, please feel free to go there and peruse the various subjects we've got. There's a lot of great information there. Second of all, as today's webinar commences, um, you'll see on your right hand of your screen there in the little pane, uh, there is a question box. Uh, if you don't see it, just click on the little orange arrow that'll maximize that box so you can see it. Um, please feel free as we go along today, if any questions come up, please type them in there. And at the end of the webinar, we will get to as many of those as we can. So that about wraps up all the housekeeping. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to push this over to Gino. Take it away, Gino. Okay, thanks a lot, Cheryl, and thanks to everyone for joining us. I would also like to thank Thomas Banks for joining us today, who is, uh, again, responsible for some of the products uh, that you're going to see uh, here that we're going to talk about today. So, um, by by way of introduction here, uh, again, the, the title of the of the webinar is "How to Get Better Audio for Video," and I think "get" is sort of the operative word that uh, that we're looking at here because um, you know there's lots of different aspects to the audio part of video production, but really capturing the audio or getting the audio is kind of a key sort of element and uh, of course microphones and microphone technique are a a key element in making sure that the audio you get is good uh, and that really applies to whether you're doing video or you're you know re recording an album in a studio or no matter no matter what you're doing the more you can do to try and capture the audio correctly up front is just going to minimize the amount of work and processing and all that other stuff that you have to go through kind of on the on the back end so you know we're not going to spend so much on the on the back end of things but really more talk about um, again how what what are the things you can do to try and, and capture audio correctly up front uh, this is a topic that uh, that we've actually been talking about for, for, for many many years here at sure uh, we have a whole library of educational publications that are available to download for free from our website um, in PDF format but back back before there was PDFs when you actually had to get paper copies of these things the very first sure educational publication that we ever had was called uh, the guide to better audio and even though it didn't say it specifically in the title it was really the guide to better audio for video production it was specifically written um, to help people who were involved in video learn what they need to do to capture audio uh, correctly up front and audio is sometimes a, a mystery to people who who do do that for their full-time profession so if video is your full-time profession and uh, and you have to worry about the audio end of it too uh, we can understand where there'd be some confusion there so we've always spent a lot of time uh, trying to to help pe uh, people involved in video production get get better at getting their audio and so one of the things you have to look at before anything else is is how do you record what what uh, what are you using to capture your audio there are several different ways it can be done and they're all they're all sort of uh, valid but they all do require some sort of a microphone obviously the most basic thing to do is use whatever microphone happens to be built into your camera uh, or camcorder or whatever your uh, recording device happens to be. Uh, one of the pitfalls or downfalls of that particular technique is in the microphone is not necessarily in the best place. It's on the camera and really you'd ra rather have the microphone be closer to the sound source and that's uh, kind of going to be an overriding theme that you're going to see as we go through this today. We're going to talk about uh, getting the microphone close several times. Um, so you can see you can record directly to uh, to your camera, you can record to a computer and then sync the audio to the camera in post-production later on. If you need to use multiple microphones, which is certainly a valid technique, and maybe even multiple wireless microphones, the the uh, setup can get even more complicated and because then it starts requiring either multi-track recorders or mixing devices to mix the audio together before it gets to the camera. Uh, again, there's many different um, 
different ways that you can record. But the mic techniques, again, choosing uh, the right mic and putting it in the right place um, are, are valid, really no matter how you end up recording it uh, in, in the long run. These are going to apply. And in order to kind of save time here today, we're not really going to be able to go too two application specific here. So we won't be doing a section on, you know, wedding videographers and another section for people who record corporate meetings and another section for that because uh, we'd probably be here all day. Um, but what we will do is, again, as we go through these different suggestions, you'll probably see yourself in some of these applications and say, ah, that's how I do it or ah, that's how I need to record and, and that will then, will then apply. So first of all, um, let's start with some microphone basics, which again apply really no matter what you happen to be recording or how you happen to be recording. But they're the things about microphones that uh, you kind of need to know uh, if you uh, if you're if you're going to use them correctly. The first thing we want to talk about is the operating principle of the microphone itself, which is how it does what it does. Microphones are transducers, which is anything that takes one form of energy and converts it into another form of energy. In the case of a microphone, that means that it takes uh, acoustic energy or sound waves and changes them into an electrical signal that can be uh, digitized and recorded or amplified or manipulated in, in any number of ways. But that's really the microphone's job. That's, that's one thing that it needs to do. <clears throat> There's a couple of different ways it can be done. The most common way that it's done, and probably the most popular microphones that you'll see are what are called dynamic microphones. Uh, where you can see a cutaway of a dynamic microphone there, uh, which is a very simple device. It's really just a, a coil of wire wound around a magnet and attached to a very uh, thin diaphragm. And when sound waves strike the diaphragm, the diaphragm moves back and forth, also moving the coil, which is suspended in that magnetic field. And through the process of induction, a varying uh, a current and a varying voltage is uh, is induced on that wire. And that's how you get your electrical signal. So it's a really a very simple device, which makes them very reliable and also very rugged. You can stand out in a hurricane with some of the better dynamic mics and not have to worry about the, the microphone there. And they're relatively inexpensive as, as microphones go. Also, they don't require any power in order to operate. And they sound pretty good. Um, and actually, uh, you can't even overdrive them. Like the idea that, you know, you could, you, there's not a human being in the world that can produce enough signal to actually cause distortion within a dynamic microphone. However, uh, the compromise there is that um, they're somewhat limited in terms of their sensitivity. That is how they respond to uh, weaker or quieter sounds. So when you're using a dynamic microphone, pretty much you, you have to be right on top of that thing. You want to be right in into it uh, as close as as possible. For more distant um, microphone techniques, dynamic mics just really don't work so great because of their, their limited sensitivity. So for example, if you're thinking about using like a shotgun microphone, a shotgun microphones are almost always going to be, well, probably always going to be condenser microphones simply because they're typically used a little bit further away than than a dynamic microphone might be. Dynamic mics tend to be somewhat large as well. Um, the physical structure of it requires it to be a little bit bigger. So if um, if size is an issue as well as sensitivity, that's where you start looking more towards the condenser type of microphone, which is um, a much smaller microphone element that is also able to respond better to weaker sounds. So they're basically more sensitive than a dynamic microphone, which makes them better for distant miking applications. Uh, they do tend to be a little bit more sensitive to environmental conditions. You don't necessarily want to get them wet if you can avoid it. Um, of course, they're, always, they're going to be a little bit more expensive, and they require power in order to operate. Condenser microphones require something called phantom power, although in some cases they might be powered by a battery. But most times they're going to get phantom power, which is a voltage supplied by the next device in the chain. So whatever the microphone has to be plugged into needs to be capable of providing phantom power in order for it to work. Probably one of the most common um, support calls we get here at Sure is from people who buy a condenser microphone and plug it in and it doesn't work. And they call us and they say, it doesn't work. We say, did you turn on phantom power? And uh, either they know what that is and they make it work or they don't. And then we have a conversation about what phantom power is. So uh, you do need to make sure that, uh, that, that, that you have that if you're using condenser microphones. The next thing I want to talk about is frequency response, which is basically a fancy way of saying, what does the microphone sound like? There are two 
common types of responses that you might see, something called shaped response, which there can be many variations of, and then something called flat response. What we're looking at here are, is a frequency response graph, which plots frequency versus sensitivity. So <clears throat> where the, uh, the, the line goes up means the microphone is more sensitive at those particular frequencies, and where the line goes down means that the microphone is less sensitive at those particular frequencies. And... Uh, in the case of a flat response microphone, what that basically means is that the microphone is relatively equal in terms of its response at all frequencies. So it's going to give you the most accurate, or sometimes people would say high fidelity sound, and also has wider frequency response. And this tends to be the frequency response that's more typical of condenser microphones versus the shaped response is a little more typical of, of some dynamic microphones. So your first impulse might be to look at this and be like, well, you'd want the flat response, right? Isn't that what you want? Not necessarily. It really depends on what you're miking. Particularly in video production applications, a lot of what you're probably doing is, um, is recording speech, somebody talking, right? And the human voice does not produce frequencies across the entire range of 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. Uh, it's somewhat limited more towards in the middle part of the frequency range. There's very few humans that can produce much energy below about 100 hertz or so. What's below 100 hertz is more like a wind noise that you might pick up and handling noise and rumble and things that you don't necessarily need in your recording. So a microphone like the one on the top here that has the shaped response where the response starts to drop off below about 100 hertz is actually uh, quite useful because, again, you'll get everything you need from the human voice and not all the low-frequency stuff you don't need. And, again, above about 10,000 hertz or so, is again, there's not a lot happening up there that helps with intelligibility or the clarity of the human voice. So kind of, again, attenuating that stuff can just sort of clean things up. And the fact that the microphone is more sensitive in this sort of 2K to 5K range here is actually beneficial because that's where consonant sounds are, which are the things that help us communicate and understand what's being said. So if you're worried about intelligibility and clarity, a microphone that's a little more sensitive in this range uh, can actually be, be beneficial. But if you're recording a music recital of some sort of concert and you really want to get that full range natural sound of the ensemble or, or choir or something like that, then the flat frequency response on the bottom is actually somewhat preferred because you're going to be able to get all the lows of the low instruments and the low keys on the piano and all the sparkle of the high end and all that stuff that you need for a good natural sounding recording. So these exist and they're worth taking a look at. Keeping in mind that you know no, no chart in the world or graph that you look at is going to tell you exactly how a microphone sounds. Your ears still need to hear it to really know what it's going to sound like, but these graphs can give you at least some idea of what you're looking at with the microphone. Now we want to talk about the directional response, also known as the polar pattern of the microphone. And this is how the microphone responds to sounds coming at it from different directions. You can break them down into two types. Again, omnidirectional, meaning it picks up sound from all directions, and unidirectional, meaning it picks up sound from only one direction. And then there are many different variations of unidirectional types of microphones. The omnidirectional microphone, again, as you can see by looking at it on the left side here, again, is uh, sensitive to sound coming at from any direction. So the benefit there is that you don't have to worry about aiming the microphone so much because it doesn't really matter which way it's pointing, it's, it's going to be able to pick up um, the subject. Again, the cardioid microphone can be useful because you can aim it towards a particular sound source and away from other sound sources. And again, the reason it's called cardioid is because if you look at the the, the polar response here, it kind of looks like a heart, right? So like cardio, like cardiovascular, right? So a heart-shaped pattern there where, again, at the zero degree mark at the top is where the microphone is most sensitive and it's least sensitive 180 degrees off at the back. Um, but again, like anything else, there's some some, you know, some downsides as well as some upsides. So one thing to keep in mind with a cardioid pattern microphone is that uh, it, it has something called actually any unidirectional microphone has something called proximity effect, which is an increase in bass response from the microphone as you get closer to it. So um, you need to be aware when you're using these types of microphones, if you've got someone that's really eating the microphone, they're going to sound really bassy and really full. And then if the next person over is using the same mic, but they're a foot away from it, they're going to sound much, much thinner maybe compared to the other person. Or if someone moves around a lot in front of the microphone, you're going to hear all that change in the low frequency response. And unidirectional microphones tend to be more sensitive to handling noise and wind noise, um, which can be an issue if you're outdoors and pee popping and things like that. These are all potential things to watch out for with a, with a unidirectional microphone. But again, the benefit of being able to reject um, unwanted sounds is extremely useful in a noisy environment. The noisier the environment, the better off you are with a 
with a cardio head pattern microphone. And then the shotgun microphone is, again, an extreme variation of a unidirectional microphone where you've got a, a microphone that is able to um, have very, very good off-axis rejection of unwanted sounds and really sort of only be listening, for lack of a better term, to what's going on directly in front of the microphone. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit more about shotgun microphones in detail uh, when we get a little deeper into the, into the topic here. Let's uh, <clears throat> talk about a couple of myths that people have about microphones and, and why you want to watch out for these sorts of things. The, the number one thing you need to know about microphones is that they're lazy. They don't work very hard to do what they do. Um, and so that means that there is no such thing as microphone reach. Microphones do not go out and grab sound and bring them closer to the microphone. Uh, unlike, say, a zoom lens on a camera, right, where like when you use the zoom, you actually get the appearance that the subject is now closer to you than it was. Um, any kind of directional microphone, even a shotgun microphone, does not go out and bring sounds closer to you. And sounds decay as you get further away. It's a, it's a 6 dB drop in level every time you double the distance. That means that if you go a microphone that was 6 inches away, you go 12 inches away, you've lost 6 dB in terms of signal level, and that can be make a you know, significant difference in what you're capturing. So um, you want to keep the microphones close, again, because it doesn't matter what kind of mic you're using, you know, there's a lot of loss in the terms of the signal because of the distance. On top of that, any room has uh, a certain amount of background noise and reverberation in it. Um, and there's a, there's a point in the room that's called the critical distance, which is the point where the microphone, uh, I'm sorry, where the direct sound from the subject and the background noise in the room are equal in level. And if your microphone is beyond that critical distance, if it's that far away, um, then uh, you end up with a really a poor sound. It, it, it's that sort of, uh, maybe it's, someone says, it sounds like you're in the, the bottom of a barrel or you're in a tin can or it's just really, you know, reverberant. It sounds like you're in an echo chamber. Whatever it happens to be, that's usually a result of a microphone that is beyond the critical distance. It's so far away from the subject that it picks up an equal amount of noise and reverberation. So how do you fix that? You keep the microphone as close as possible. It, critical distance is something that can be measured, but I'm not suggesting you need to go out and measure critical distance every time. I'm just saying if you keep the microphone as close close as possible, then you don't have to really worry about it so much. The next thing you have to watch out for in microphone placement is something called comb filtering. Um, comb filtering is very erratic frequency response that actually, when you chart it out, tends to look like the graph on the right, which sort of resembles a cone. There's deep notches and peaks in the frequency response, which has a very hollow um, not very pleasing sound. And comb filtering is created when sound from takes multiple paths to get to the microphone. So what we're looking at on the, on the right is the direct sound from the talker's mouth going to the microphone, but the sound also reflecting off of the desktop and taking a longer path to get to the microphone. When, that ha when those sound waves combine at the microphone, you end up with this comb filtering that doesn't sound very good. So you really want to watch out for reflective surfaces. This is uh, particularly important when we're thinking about uh, shotgun microphone placement as well. You have to really have to watch out for reflective surfaces there because of the comb filtering you can get. So again, keeping the microphone closer, taking advantage of the directional properties of the microphone to minimize pickup of reflections, these will also help improve sound quality that gets captured. Comb filtering can also occur electronically as well, and that's when multiple microphones pick up the same sound source. So you may find yourself in a situation where you've got multiple talkers that you need to record, and you want to be able to get the um, uh, you want to have enough microphones out there to get everybody, but you want to make sure that you place your microphones in a way that you don't have more than one microphone picking up the same sound source. Again, comb filtering can uh, can result. The easiest way to avoid electronic comb filtering is to follow something we call the three, three to one rule, which basically states that for every unit of distance a microphone is from the sound source, the next microphone should be three times that distance away. So if you've got microphones one foot from the talker, put the next microphone three feet away, and then uh, you will avoid that uh, comb filtering problem. So if you're doing maybe a panel discussion or something like that, and you've got mics on the panel, again, uh, try to space people out, you know, the microphone's about three feet to avoid the comb filtering. Another way to handle this is to use an automatic microphone mixer, which is getting a little beyond the scope of this webinar, but um, some automatic mic mixers can um, prevent uh, multiple microphones from turning on from the same sound source. 
So we're going on the assumption here that uh, we've convinced you to use an external microphone. And when you're using an external microphone, you now run into connectivity issues. Um, unfortunately, with many, um, how should we say, prosumer type devices, like some camcorders and DSL, DSLR cameras out there, there's not really a, a standard configuration that is used for the microphone input. And in most cases, it's different than what's used in professional audio, which is the three pin XLR type connector, a balanced interconnect uh, for connecting professional microphones to professional devices. Um, you really do want to use that connection whenever possible. But again, in a lot of other types of devices, you're going to see um, the mini plug type connector, 3.5 millimeter mini plug being very common. If you're recording to a computer, you might run into a USB connector. Um, but let's let's look, a, look at a couple examples here. So again, let's assume you're recording directly on your camera, right? Probably a little bit hard to see there, but that is a little 3.5 millimeter mini jack that could be wired who knows how. Uh, again, there's no standard. Could be mono, could be stereo, could have voltage on it that's needed for some um, external microphones. Maybe you need to block that voltage. If you want to kind of avoid dealing with all of those issues and you want to use a professional microphone and not have to guess at things, it's usually best to just use um, an interface that is designed for going to camcorders. This particular one is made by a company called Beach Tech. You can see it actually um, can mount directly to, uh, to a camera underneath it, and then it gives you three-pin balanced XLR inputs for your microphones, and then the output, and it's hard to see the word there, it says out is a 3.5 millimeter mini plug that will work with most uh, most cameras, but again, Beach Tech and others have many different models, some that are going to very specific cameras, but if you have an interface like this, preferably one with phantom power as well, if you're using condenser microphones, then all of the connectivity headaches go away and it typically just works. So an, an interface, a pro mic to prosumer camera interface is a great thing to have. If you're recording on your computer, you can run into the same problem. Again, computers have a mini plug type mic input that really isn't designed for professional microphones. If you want to use a pro mic, get an XLR to USB interface and just record directly to the through the USB input on your computer. Again, something like the Shure X2U here has adjustable mic gain and 48 volt phantom power. So any condenser mic that you might want to use just goes into here, connects to your computer via USB, and you're in good shape. And if you're using an external recorder, again, just look for one that is designed for professional microphones. Um, this particular model here by Roland is actually a six track recorder, which is useful. You can record up to six individual tracks at a time. So if you're using multiple microphones and you might want to use multiple microphones sometimes if you uh, if you can, uh, depending on the application, it's useful to have a device that can record multiple tracks. Some computer inter recording interfaces can do this as well. So let's summarize where, where we're at here so far. Um, again, as we've said before, and as we'll probably say again before we're done here, keep the microphones as close as possible to the sound source. Um, then you don't have to worry about the microphone sensitivity. You don't have to worry about pickup of background noise. You'll capture good, clean, direct sound by getting that mic in nice and tight. Aim the microphones away from undesired sound sources, particularly if you're using unidirectional microphones or shotgun microphones, keeping it aimed towards the sound source and away from you know, the air vents or whatever will improve the sound of what you capture. Use as few microphones as necessary, as much as we'd like you to use lots of microphones. Um, you know, Only use the minimum that you need for the application. Observe the three to one rule if you have multiple mics out there. Use a windscreen whenever possible, particularly outdoors, and we'll talk more about windscreens in a little bit, but they're very useful devices. And finally, not specifically related to the microphone itself, but to the device that the microphone is plugged into, a lot of cameras have an automatic gain control on it, which is um, a, a, a algorithm that is designed to boost the signal level for quiet sounds and attenuate the signal level when sounds get too loud to try and get an even level. Um, but this is something that, because it happens automatically, you don't have a lot of control over, and the result can sometimes be uh, less than pleasing. Uh, you can get pumping and breathing. You hear the background noise come up. Uh, you hear sounds get squished when they get a little bit louder, and uh, it's something that you can't undo or get rid of later. And they be, it's sometimes maybe an okay thing to use if you're just using the built-in mic on the camera, which is far from the sound source anyway. But anytime you're using uh, a professional mic interface to your camera, we highly recommend you turn off the automatic gain control. You can always boost quiet sounds later in post-production if you're doing editing on your computer. 
So let's talk about selecting the right microphone now. Uh, again, we're going to look at a couple of different scenarios here and give some recommendations and things that you might use to help uh, choose the right microphone for getting the right sound. So there's lots of decisions to be made, and we're going to take kind of go through all of these in turn. We're going to talk about you know going wired versus going wireless, and what are the things you need to look for in a wireless system for video production, and look at the different physical design characteristics that come into play uh, when you are when you are choosing a microphone, lav mics, handheld mics, shotgun mics, putting the mic on the camera, what are the pros and cons of each of these? So really it's about, you know, trying to achieve the best setup that, uh, that you can get. Um, but sometimes there's compromises that need to be made, but let's, let's start at the beginning here. I'm actually going to turn it over to, uh, to Thomas for a minute. Cause as we were kind of planning out the topics for this webinar, you know, he came up with this really great concept of like, well, let's start from the ideal, you know, let's see if, if everything, if it was a perfect world and you could do everything in the perfect way. How would you do it? And then what are the compromises? Right. Right. Good morning, everyone. So typically, if, if you're going to have a, a shooting situation, you've got some compromises right off the bat. Ideally, I've got an unlimited budget. I can acquire as much gear as I need, and I've got all the assistance necessary to manage that gear for me. I don't have to be wearing all the hats. And the environment is such that I don't have to deal with anything like reflections or jet airplanes or a train nearby or whatever it may be. Um, but Typically, you're going to make some kind of compromise. And um, if you're on this call, chances are you probably have to make a lot of them. Um, not all of us can be Steven Spielberg with our big budget. Um, if you've got to make compromises, the first thing you're probably going to have to think about is, can I, <clears throat> can I put a mic on every person? And can I put it six inches from their mouth? Um, if you can do that, you're pretty good. Can you monitor? You need to monitor all the time, no matter where you're at. Uh, try not to make that a compromise. Um, but if, if you can't do these things, then you're going to start making compromises. Maybe you have to, you can't put a mic on everybody. You might have to put a mic in front of them. Maybe it'll be a handheld. Um, if, you, if you can't put a mic in front of them, you might have to put a mic over them, in which case you may have to use a shotgun mic. That's great if you've got somebody that can boom for you, um, or if you can position it in such a way that it's off camera and you're just using a static shot. If you can't do that, then you're probably going to have to put the camera back, sorry, put the microphone back onto the camera and settle with that, which may be the ultimate compromise. But nevertheless, people can get away with it, really, depending on how far the camera is away from the uh, subject. Good. So let's take a look at this starting from the beginning here, which would be, you know, again, there's probably always, always some compromises, but let's say we're starting from the sort of ideal setup here, right? What would it take to accomplish this? Well, you're probably going to end up wireless and you're probably going to end up using a lavalier microphone. This kind of hits all the criteria of, um, again, a microphone per talker, right? That they don't have to hold in their hand because they can wear it. And you can use a very small lavalier microphone, such as like the uh, sure, MX150, which is pictured here, um, is a pretty small microphone that, you know, it can even, if you're using the omnidirectional one, can even be hidden in lots of different places. You know, the best placement is always kind of directly, you know, below the mouth, about six inches, but with an omni lavalier, you can put them, you can, you know, hide them on glasses, or you can uh, put them in the hairline or over the ear or something like that. There's all kinds of uh, silly places you can put an omnidirectional lavalier microphone. But again, the point here is we've had to go wireless, we've had to use a lavalier microphone, um, and we put one on every person. So again, talk about budgets being unlimited. If you've got lots of subjects and each one needs a wireless microphone, you can start talking about some serious dollars here, um, but it's something that can be done. And then, of course, you're looking at an external recording device to record all of those tracks individually so that you can mix them down later in post-production to get a nice blend of everything. And there's the question of compromise again. A lot of guys I know will start off with an Omni if they can afford it. That is to say, if the ambient noise floor of the environment they are in will enable them to use an Omni, they'll always use an Omni. Correct, right. yeah. Your first compromise may be to settle for a directional mic if you're fighting some ambient. Exactly, exactly. Um, again, and why is that a compromise? You know, I mean, we like to use omnidirectional microphones for the reasons I mentioned earlier, which again is that they're less sensitive to wind noise, less sensitive to handling noise. In the case of a lavalier mic, that means they're less sensitive to actually clothing noise or movement noise as the cable might move around. Um, you don't, have, again, worry less about pee popping and, and those sorts of things. And again, you can place them wherever you would, you would like. Um, 
again, the desired placement for a lavalier microphone is typically, you know, about six to eight inches directly below the chin. If you are using a cardioid or unidirectional lavalier microphone, it pretty much has to go there anywhere else in your way off axis. And it just doesn't sound, it doesn't sound good. So again, use, choosing an Omni will typically give you the most natural response, but in certain high noise environments, compromise you might have to make is go to a, to a cardioid pattern lavalier microphone. Um, and again, uh, you know, using a windscreen is always is always a good plan um, with a with a lavalier microphone. There are also omnidirectional ear set microphones, which are very small and go over the top of the ear. And those are nice because they do get the microphone in in even closer and in a very consistent um, way in terms of no matter which way you move your head, the mic position always stays the same. However, um, that kind of defeats the purpose of the microphone being invisible. So if you have a mic, even a really small mic coming down the side of your cheek um, on video, that's probably going to show up. So talking about compromises, this is the first thing we run into uh, besides maybe the choice of Omni versus cardioid is, well, the talent either won't or can't for whatever reason wear a microphone, or maybe it's an interview and it's not you know, a, a, a man on the street interview or something where it's not practical to go around and saying, here, let me put this body pack and lavalier microphone on you. What do you do? Well, that's where you start going to a handheld microphone again, because um, we haven't gotten to the point where uh, we want to keep the microphone off camera. So we need to go with, uh, you know, something that we can see, but still gets the microphone in nice and close. So uh, handheld mics are the way to go. Uh, and again, in this case, they could be wired or wireless. It really depends on how you want to do it. Uh, many times they are wireless using a plug-on transmitter of the type that you see kind of pictured here, right? Although you could use just a handheld, a wireless handheld like the one on the right here that is the transmitter and everything is all built into it. Um, the reason that you see um, plug-on cameras used, a lot, uh, sorry, plug-on um, transmitters used a lot in video production and electronic news gathering is because you're typically going to want to use an omnidirectional microphone. And most wireless handhelds, except for the uh, BP68 pictured here, most wireless handheld mics are cardioid pattern. And if you wanted to use an Omni, or maybe you have a favorite Omni wired handheld mic, the plug-on transmitter um, allows you to take, convert any wired microphone into a wireless microphone. Some tips for using handheld mics, again, as we said, use Omni whenever possible because of the reasons we talked about. Again, 6 to 12 inches from the talker's mouth, particularly if it's a dynamic microphone, probably closer to that 6-inch mark because they're le less sensitive, and pointing up at about a 45-degree angle. And the reason for that is to avoid the the plosives, the P-pops, the T's, the things that cause the, you know, you say a P, but you get a low-frequency thump in your audio, and that's that's the result, again, of a... Of a, of a plosive sound and keeping the microphone kind of pointing up at a 45 degree angle instead of having your mouth right on it will minimize the chances of getting those p-pops because then the breath blast goes past the microphone instead of directly into it and those things are nasty i mean they can sometimes be removed in post-production editing but they're tricky so better to position the mic in a way that just minimizes it all together Let's talk about wireless for a minute here since since we brought it up in both of these scenarios that again the lavalier probably essentially being wireless and in the handheld case you might have the option to go to it what are the what are the things you want to look for um, some general rules of thumb for wireless microphones these days are you know make sure you pick something that is frequency agile that is tunable which means that you have uh, a lot of frequencies that you can choose from on the wireless system itself those are uh, that's kind of an essential thing with spectrum getting more crowded and more stuff going on. Um, you really do want to make sure that you've got something that is that has lots of selectable frequencies and even better, a system that can scan and identify clear frequencies for you. If you can tell the receiver, hey, go ahead and find a clear frequency for me, uh, then you're guaranteed you'll be on a good one and that will minimize the chance of dropout. Remember, a lot of what you're capturing might be a one-time live event wedding being probably a great example of that. You can't really say, could you go back and do that again? Because we kind of missed a little bit here. So careful frequency selection with wireless systems is is really sort of a of a of a critical uh, of a critical kind of element here. So that those are those are some kind of general things you want to you want to look for there. Uh, we have a couple of different options in terms of uh, wireless systems that are really designed specifically for broadcast and video production applications. Um, the first one is in our UHFR series, which is actually a series that's been out since about 2005. So it's it's a very um, road 
a proven system. Again, it's been a, a premium system for a, uh, for a long time, but just recently we expanded it to be useful for video production by adding two devices, a plug-on transmitter and a portable receiver that can be uh, mounted on or connected to a, to a camera because it's battery powered. So what you're looking at here is the UR3 plug-on transmitter, uh, which is a uh, nice all metal construction with phantom power. So you can use it with condenser microphones, something you really want to pay attention to when you're selecting a plug-on transmitter. What kind of mics are you going to be using with? Because if it's a condenser mic, it has to have phantom power. And one of the things that sets the UR3 apart from some of the uh, competition is its shape, which is really designed uh, kind of like a bicycle hand grip to be very comfortable and hold in your hand. A lot of the other um, plug-on transmitters tend to be uh, very blocky and square and not not the most comfortable thing to hold in the world. Uh, so that was kind of an a, a interesting uh, design thing here. It also has a lot of adjustable parameters on it in terms of uh, being able to set adjustable low frequency roll off, change change the sensitivity very easily, and all of those settings can be stored in a mic preset list. So if you have several different microphones that you might connect to your to your UR3, um, you can just you know plug in the mic, recall the proper preset, and all of your sensitivity and low frequency roll off phantom, all of that will be set for you already. And it can be used, along with every other UR transmitter, with the UR5 portable receiver. This is a UHF diversity frequency agile receiver with built-in scanning, all-metal construction, and it's essentially identical to the full-size rack mount UR receiver. So if you're familiar with the UHFR UR4S single-channel receiver, it's identical except packed into a, a tiny little body pack here, which is, I suppose, quite a feat in and of itself. Um, relative to Thomas's comment on always monitor, this has headphone monitoring jack on it, so you can plug your earphones or headphones directly into the UR5 to hear exactly what it is that uh, the wireless microphone is transmitting. Um, and there's lots of different powering options as well. It'll run on um, AA batteries, but we have it's also compatible with the Shure SB900 rechargeable battery, which gives you better battery battery metrics and longer life, or it can be powered um, external DC powering from a, from a camera battery as well. So again, that's the UR5. If that's a, a little rich for your budget, we also have the FP series. FP, I guess, could stand for field production if you want to think of it that way, uh, which is a series of mics that is based off of our SLX series, but is, again, designed uh, specifically for video production, particularly, again, in the case of the camera mount receiver here, the FP5 which includes a hot shoe mount that can be mounted directly to the camera, and the proper output cables are included, an XLR if you have XLR inputs, or the 3.5 millimeter if that's where you need to go. Again, lots of frequencies, <clears throat> and the ability um, for the receiver also to scan for a clear frequency. Uh, this one runs on AA batteries only. Uh, there is no external powering options for it, but you get um, pretty good battery life um, on those AA alkalines. And we have a plug-on transmitter that goes with the FP series as well. Um, it's actually the same metal case that's used on the UR3, but we call this one the FP3. Uh, the difference is that you'll notice it doesn't have an LCD display on it, so there's not all the sort of fancy configuration options, but you can adjust the gain properly if you need to. Uh, and importantly, it does not have phantom power. So if you really are using condenser microphones that you want to make wireless with a plug-on, you really want to be with the UR3 series. However, the FP3 um, is great for, for dynamic microphones. And then there's also handheld and body pack options available in the FP series as well. And these all run on AA batteries, um, and about 12 hours of battery life, which is really pretty good for alkaline batteries there. Again, the body pack will work with any Shure lavalier microphones that you choose. And on the handhelds, you have the option of the SM58, which is your cardioid pattern dynamic, or the VP68, which is an omnidirectional condenser mic. So again, nice and sensitive and picks up sound from all directions. So if you're going to use an omni for interviews and you don't want to deal with a plug-on transmitter, transmitter, the uh, FP transmitter with the VP68 is a, is a good combination. So that's a little about wireless there, but more compromises. Um, not only will the talent not wear a microphone or can't wear a microphone, you don't want the microphone in the camera shot either. Um, and or uh, budget doesn't allow you to afford wireless anyway, so you really have no choice but to go to some other wired option, but you still don't want to see the microphone on the camera. And that's where you turn to Shotgun microphones. Thomas, what can you tell us about shotgun microphones? Shotgun microphones, they are wonderful devices. Um, they are kind of the outlier in the microphone family. A lot of people are familiar with um, polar patterns, um, omni and cardioid and supercardioid and hypercardioid. Well, shotgun microphones, they're condensers. 
The polar pattern begins with a capsule that is generally tuned to be either a hyper or supercardioid, and then a second element, an interference tube, is added onto the front of that that then creates a low bar polar pattern, which is um, one degree of directionality greater than a hypercardioid. Um, so that is where the interference tube takes over at a certain frequency from the hypercardioid and makes the microphone even more directional. The frequency at which it takes over is dependent upon the length of the interference tube. The interference tube operating principle requires that an interference tube be greater than or equal to the length of the sound wave it is trying to cancel from the sides. And so, as we know, high frequency sound waves are very short, so they're, even a short shotgun can be good at canceling high frequency sound waves. Low frequency sound waves are very long, so if you wanted a fully directional shotgun that could reject off-axis frequencies as low as 100 hertz, you would need a shotgun microphone that was around 11 feet long. Um, is that a problem? <laughs> <clears throat> depends on your application, I guess. Um, so uh, because no shotgun is going to do that, they typically have what is uh, Gino referred to earlier as a shaped response, meaning that the low frequency information is rolled off because generally off-axis low frequency information is not your friend. Um, Sure offers a variety of shotguns, and the difference of the interference tubes is directly related to the applications that you may want to use them for. The v, uh, VP89L, a very long shotgun, um, it starts going low bar at around 500 hertz, which is very low, and it has an off-axis rejection of around 15 degrees. So that is to say, if you were to point that at your subject and then go uh, about 15 degrees either way from the subject, you're going to notice a very steep drop-off in your signal. Um, they're very unforgiving. So you've got to have a really good uh, boom operator. And you typically really only need something that's that directional if you're trying to avoid a lot of unwanted off-axis ambient sound, say at a very loud sporting event where you can't get close to the element that you want to capture, which may be, for instance, um, the squeak of the feet on the basketball court or the crack of the bat, right? Those are typically what they're used for. So kind of a, a very niche application. Most people are gonna want probably a medium or a short shotgun, which then have a different pickup angles. Uh, me, sure, Gina. I was just gonna say, just to give people a sense of scale here, about how long is that long shotgun microphone? You got me. <laughs> I don't have a measurement offhand now. I, I, do, I do remember it a couple but, of years ago, but I'm going to say... Offhand, it's about two feet. Yeah. So I'm just maybe sure I can find it for us on the web. But it's, um, it's a baton. I mean, it's fairly long. Yeah. Um, the old SM89 was even longer. We took about three inches out of that preamp when we redesigned it a few, uh, two or three years ago. Um, so it's, it's still... It's one of the longer shotguns out there. Um, mm -hmm. But very good at what it does. It is extremely good at what it does. Most people want a little bit of ambience, you know, just not that much. And they, you know, if they may be a little bit closer to their source than a, um, a long shotgun would require. So if you're closer to your source, you can deal with um, <clears throat> a little bit of a wider pickup angle and you might like a little more ambience. You're probably going to aim for a medium shotgun or a short shotgun. The pickup uh, angle on those goes from like 50 degrees to 70 degrees. So they get wider and wider. And you can actually see that if I go back and forth to the different images here and notice how the, the, the uh, front response of the microphone gets wider or narrower in the case of going backwards. So there's long and then it gets a little bit <clears throat> more super cardioid looking as we go to medium and even more so when we go to the short shotgun, depending on the frequency you're looking at. So the higher frequencies are the lines that are closer and tighter in, and the, the, the bigger outlier lines are, the, uh, are the, uh, the lower frequencies. And you can see as you squeeze that um, polar pattern to make it more directional, you pay for that with a greater rear lobe, which is especially important to be aware of when you are attempting to use or boom with a long shotgun mic. You need to keep that rear lobe um, pointed at the sky, uh, or typically at some place where there's no reflected sound that's going to be coming back and interfering with your signal. Cool. 
the uh, VP89 uh, long, the interference tube itself is 15.21 inches, additional to the 4.02 inches of the capsule. So we're talking about 19 inches there. So a 19 inch long. A little device. bit less than two feet. Now, one thing we forgot to mention this the other day, we do have a kind of nifty little accessory um, that actually allows you to uh, take the preamp off, which if we didn't say this yet, the preamp is detachable from the interference tube on all of these. And so you could actually have one preamp and multiple interference tubes and just choose the right length depending on the application, which is kind of neat. But the fact that you can take the preamp off you can put this little U-shaped accessory in line that allows the preamp to wrap around the bottom of the uh, interference tube, kind of in a U-shape, um, which takes some additional length off of it if you need to. So um, it would remove about four inches or so from the overall length, kind of doubling it up or wrapping it underneath the interference tube. Yeah, it's like four inches plus the XLR connector, which is usually like an inch. So it, it, it generally um, is really useful when you want to use a long shotgun microphone in an on-camera application. It allows you to use a longer shotgun and keep it out of the lens. I call that the double barrel adapter. Double barrel adapter. <laughs> it's a nice little thing. Um, so the right, so the VP89 family, they're all interchangeable. One preamp um, and then three different interference tube capsule combinations. The VP82 is our entry level shotgun. It has generally the same characteristics as the VP89S or our short shotgun. However, it's not modular, uh, so you can't unscrew the preamp. Great. But it is about half the price. It's a great bargain. So some general tips for using shotgun mics. Again, um, position just out of the camera shot. The point of using them is so you don't see the microphone. But again, just like everything else, still keep it as close as possible. Just because it's a shotgun microphone doesn't mean you can put it clear across the room and expect it to pick up just as well as if it was you know, a foot away. So you always want to keep it as close as possible just right out of camera shot. Um, again, avoid aiming it at a reflective surface, which could cause issues with uh, comb filtering, as we talked about earlier. Rubber isolated shock mounts and windscreens, because of the high directionality of these microphones, are more or less um, essential. You, you probably be very rare to find a circumstance where you wouldn't be using one or both of those devices. Sure has uh, a number of uh, actually uh, Rycote accessories that were designed specifically for the uh, VP89 series and as well as VP82 um, that are, can be mounted to cameras and there's pistol grips and boom mounts and all kinds of good things that work um, directly with the microphone. Um, as well as again the uh, softy windshields and kits that include both the um, the rubber isolation mounts and the big the big furry windshields here which again the the way the the way these things work and how well they work is actually um, it's amazing. pretty amazing yeah I, Rycote originally these, these things are ubiquitous everywhere and everyone makes them what I'll say about Rycote stuff is that it's really durable it's used by professional level filmmakers the world round they won the original Oscar for this I think uh, I don't know, back in the 70s, you can look it up on their website, but they were the ones that first discovered that fur actually kills wind. I don't know <laughs> how they did it, but um, it was amazing. Yeah, I'd like to be in on that conversation. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, final compromise here. We want to make sure we have some time to get some, some questions here. Is The, the, the uh, last situation here is not only does the microphone can't be on camera, and you can't put a microphone on the talent, and you're not able to use wireless, you're pretty much that, oh, and you don't have um, a boom operator or an audio engineer to kind of help you out. It's pretty much just, uh, you know, your own show and you're on your own here. You might end up back at putting a microphone on the camera, but there's still an alternative to using the microphone that was built into the camera, and that is getting an external camera-mounted microphone, uh, such as you see here, which is the Shure uh, VP83 and 83F. Um, what can you tell us about those microphones? Right. So, yeah, if, if you want a or need a on-camera solution, which is not a bad thing to have, even if you have other um, microphones present, redundancy is always great. The more microphones, the better, as long as you're following the rules we laid out earlier in terms of placement. Um, the thing about this is that it's not inside the camera, right? It's above the camera, so it's not going to pick up the handling noise or the motor noise. Um, it's got a great Rycoat shock mount that we developed in conjunction with them. It's a unique implementation of their patented Lyre system. Lyre, not like we're not telling you the truth, but Lyre, L-Y-R-E, like British for a harp that you strung, right? And that's based on their design. But uh, it's made of this special material that's designed to eliminate any mechanical noise coming up from the, uh, from the camera um, and isolate the microphone. So 
these have full metal housing, right? They're RF immune, they're condenser microphones, they're high sensitive, um, highly sensitive, they're low self noise, and they're shotgun microphones, although they may not appear to be so because the preamp has been wrapped around below it. And instead of having the big old grill interference tube that is on our VP89s, we've just stripped it away and left the interior interference tube. But believe it or not, the interference tube on these two microphones is the same exact length as our VP89S and VP82 XLR shotgun microphones. Um, the VP83 is simply that. It's a shotgun microphone. It has um, an on-off switch, a low-cut filter, and it has a three-position gain switch. So it's got a 20 dB boost and then a 10 dB pad. Um, the one on the right is the same. Oh, I'm sorry. The one on the left also runs on a single AA battery for 130 hours. Um, is that it? That's it, 130 <laughs> hours. <laughs> Um, and, and once the red light turns on, you still have around 12 hours of life left. The one on the right um, does everything that the one on the left does, but it's also a built-in flash recorder. So if you don't want to deal with driving the audio into the camera's preamp, because the camera's preamp is not that great to begin with, you can use our preamp, which is not an afterthought, but the primary thought in developing this uh, microphone was to create a really good audio recording solution. You can keep on the camera or you can take off the camera. It has a, a shoe mount, but it's got a threaded base. You can put it on any uh, quarter inch tripod. Um, it records micro SDHC format WAV file to a micro SDHC card. Um, uh, it can take up to a 32 gig card uh, on which it can record 60 plus hours of WAV files. Um, it's got a single button record and it runs on, it can record for 10 hours on two AA batteries. Wow, cool. And I believe, safe to say at this point, the only camera mount uh, shotgun microphone with built-in flash recording. That is true. Excellent. Kind of a unique, unique It's been thing. winning a couple of awards yeah. recently, too. It's really People seem to like it. <laughs> cool. And there, just for your information, is the, uh, again, the polar pattern, which would be typical of a short shotgun type microphone. Okay, so um, we got uh, through the prepared portion of the presentation here. Before I uh, bounce it back over to, uh, to Cheryl to see if there's any questions, I just want to remind people you can find out upcoming webinars by going to www.sure.com slash training. Uh, also, all of our older webinars, uh, and this one sometime very shortly, will be archived there by just clicking on the link webinar archives on the training page, so you can find that there. Uh, a couple of good resources to keep in mind if you'd like to learn more about this is the uh, updated version of the booklet I mentioned at the start of things here, which previously was known as the Guide to Better Audio, is now the Audio Systems Guide to Video and Film Production, written by our own Chris Lyons, and you can find that on the uh, downloads page of the Sure America's website, uh, a great, great booklet. And there's a couple of really interesting videos to check out on our YouTube channel, so youtube.com slash Sure Inc. We've got a great one on how shotgun microphones work, and also understanding mic specifications parts one through four, quite a, uh, a, a, a little bit of a time investment to go through all four of them, but I think worth it if you want to get a little bit better handle on uh, what all the different microphone specifications mean. Um, if we don't happen to get to your questions today or think, think of something later on, you can always email support at sure.com and we'll get back to you. But uh, let's see if there are any questions. What do we got? We just have a few short ones. And if you have any, any others, get them in uh, pretty quickly or we'll try and touch on those as well. But the first one um, has to do with that uh, Beach Tech um, device that you were talking about early on in the presentation, um, the, questions, the, the questioner says that they, they find that the Beach Tech introduces a high-pitched hum to his audio. And do you have any other recommendations, or is he doing something wrong? You know, I'd want to look at your audio path myself, like in person up close, to see if there was something that wasn't balanced or introducing some electromagnetic hum somewhere along the way. I do know that a lot of those... Um, DSLR preamps have what they call an AGC defeating feature, which is that they'll inject like a really high pitched, high frequency tone into one of the two channels that defeats the AGC, like an 18 or 19 kilohertz tone. Um, so if that's on and you have really good ears, that may be what you're hearing. Um, I, I mean, I've used the Beach Tech before. We have a few around here and I have had no problems with them, but they're not the only ones in the market. A lot of people really enjoy the ones from Juiced Link. J-U-I-C-E-D-L-I-N-K. Um, I know that Tascam and Fostex have also recently introduced some models like these. Um, 
So no, I'm sorry to hear that. But yeah, one thing to check out would be to unplug the microphones while the beach tech is still plugged into your camera and see, you know, does that make a difference having the mics plugged in or not? Uh, are you using phantom power? Um, again, checking your mic cables, all good things. Um, and you know, if all else fails, give the guys at beach tech a call. They're, they're pretty good, uh, helpful guys. And they might want to help you get to the bottom of this because that's something that shouldn't probably be happening with those. They just have good customer service. I found. Yeah. yeah. All right, great. Um, question about the plug-in transmitters. Those do have full XLR connectors on them, correct? Yep, that's a balanced XLR. Like I said, they'll work with any pro mic, and the UR3 has phantom power for condenser mics as well. Okay, great. Um, here's a really nice application-specific question. Here we go. Okay, it's like a story problem. Mm. Okay. Uh, the, the querent says, we attend NAM every year, which is a loud, noisy environment. Uh, they shoot product videos, and when they film a presenter, that presenter sometimes is the the presenter uh, that's being interviewed is interviewing someone else, and oftentimes the person continues talking while the camera focuses on the gear. Um, so the the built on the mic on the camera isn't really going to work for that because they're panning away from the speaker. Um, Wireless is risky in um, such a crowded environment with so many electronics, of course, it's NAM, um, but it's the only realistic solution. So would we recommend an XLR plug-on transmitter um, with a camera mount receiver? And if so, which handheld would we use in such a loud environment? And do we have any other possible solutions? Well, as someone who's been the interviewee at many trade shows for people that drop by with a camera, um, we've got some hands-on experience with this. Um, what I've found uh, most of them actually tend to use is a handheld wired microphone. Again, wireless can work, but in a trade show, particularly if you had a pro audio trade show or NAM where there's who knows how many wireless mic manufacturers there with the products fired up, you do run a certain amount of risk there. So a wired solution is probably going to be more reliable. Um, and Typically, at least in the times I've been interviewed, I'm standing pretty close to the camera anyway, even if I'm not on camera because they're shooting the products and I'm standing next to them talking, usually just, you know, a 10 foot mic cable plugged directly into maybe like a beach tech adapter or some other XLR um, adapter that will get you into your camera is probably going to be the best option. And in the case of a trade show, you know, we, we always say use Omni, use Omni, use Omni, but in a really loud trade show, no we're probably going to be better off with a cardioid. I mean, honestly, an SM58, you know, which is not too sensitive, which is good because then I can hold it close to my mouth while I'm talking and, and, you know, don't have to worry about the sensitivity issues. I'm going to hold it nice and close and I'm going to, you know, get all the advantages of the rejection of a cardioid pattern. And we're going to be wired directly through the proper adapter into the camera. You'll be in, you'll be in great shape. All right, great. I think that about wraps up our time today for questions. I think we got through most of them. Um, if we didn't get to your question or something else pops into your head, please feel free to email it to support at sure.com. And one of our knowledgeable applications engineers will get back to you with an answer in a timely manner. So we want to thank you so much for joining us on today's webinar. We hope you learned a little bit and we will see you next time.